Crypto DLT with Mr. Connector. Be sure to subscribe. Hit the notification bell for daily content. Let's go. Hey guys, it's Mr. Connector. Today is Tuesday, March 26th. We have some breaking news coming out of Maryland. Had a container ship, cargo ship, take out the key bridge in Maryland. A major route has been taking out. They're still searching for some people in this accident. And this is a major disruption to the supply chain. Nine ports, I believe, have been blocked because of this. Wow, what a mess, guys. What a mess. Let's go look at our connector coins for today. We have XDC in the first place today, past 24 hours, up 8%. We still look at the digital bits coming in second there. Of course, H bar in third. And Velo is finally making another move. And the Canary Network Songbird is still going up a little bit. What's not performing well on the connector coin list today? We have Sologenic down 4.7 and Energy Web Token down 4.5. Look at that Energy Web Token. Over the past year, it's down 25% when a lot of these other coins have, had, have seen some good gains. Not financial advice, but if you're looking to buy some coins today, this might be a good option for you because you know you always want to buy when the prices are low. And we know that Ripple has partnered with Energy Web in the past. So let's keep an eye on that one. What's going on with the XRP Ledger? You know, the AMM was halted. There was not halted. They just suggest that you not deposit any coins into the liquidity pools until they get this little bug straightened out. I believe the, the AMM is still running and they have a fix for the problem. The fix is a new version of the XRP ledger. So the, all the validator nodes, they actually have to vote on a new version and implement it. And it's going to take a couple of weeks actually. So once again, you must wait, you must wait. Imagine that we've been waiting for a while now to get a little traction in this market, but these are the coins that have AMM pools. And I can't stress enough that the top performing coin in the last 24 hours is Sologenic. We love Solo, but there's only $187,000 traded on that DEX on the Solo XRP pair. So we need to see a lot more volume before we get into this AMM, guys. And we're waiting on the sidechain amendment as well. And here I found a really good article on CoinGape about the SEC brief they submitted yesterday. Uh, breaking SEC asks Judge Torres for final judgment in the Ripple XRP lawsuit. We're getting close, guys. Uh, the SEC is has some ransom money though they want to charge. It says the U.S. SEC requests Judge Torres to approve final judgment against Ripple in the XRP lawsuit and penalties of nearly two billion dollars. Guys, it's just like a mobster. You got to pay the mob off if you want to play. It's pay to play in this country, I guess. The United States SEC reminds the federal court about violations of securities laws by Ripple Labs and asks judge to grant a final judgment against Ripple. This includes permanent injunctions, disgorgement, and prejudgment interest and civil penalties of nearly $2 billion. Ripple executives and the community criticized the SEC for irrational statements in the remedies related brief and other documents. No allegations of fraud or recklessness are just a move to punish Ripple and sabotage the bull market. Yeah, guys, it seems like every time this market tries to take off, there's some kind of attack from somewhere on it. But we know in the end, guys, you cannot stop an idea whose time has come. We know the entire world wants this, and we have a few bankers trying to hold on to power. Let's read on. U.S. SEC seeks final judgment in remedies-related brief. Uh, they're saying they violated Section 5 of the Securities and Exchange Act, conducting unregistered offerings of XRP in institutional sales. And the SEC has not argued any fraud and simply targeted the growth of Ripple despite a lawsuit. The SEC wants Torres to grant a proposed order in its favor and force Ripple to pay $876 million in disgorgement. Additionally, it seeks $198 million in prejudgment interest and $876 million in a civil penalty. 
The SEC claims Ripple's post-complaint sales are mostly to institutions and the sales harmed investors as the company even failed to disclose discounts to institutional investors. Moreover, the SEC argues Ripple continues to defy laws, mischaracterize the ruling, and evade the securities law intentionally. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse says the $2 billion penalty is illogical based on no allegations, let alone findings of fraud or recklessness. There is absolutely no precedent for this. Instead, Garlinghouse highlights the SEC's gross abuse of power in the debt box case and acting without faithful allegiance to the law in the Ripple case. Yeah, guys, no allegations or fraud or recklessness. So, the Ripple really didn't do anything wrong. They just didn't ask permission from the SEC. So that's what I'm seeing about all this. The SEC, it just, they just don't like that Ripple is successful, if you ask me. They didn't do anything wrong. They're not even alleging that, except register with the SEC. That's it. That's the whole case right there. They're saying the Ripple should have registered. But as we've seen... SEC is like the Hotel California. You can check in, but you can't. You can never check out. They just want that control. They want you under their umbrella, and they don't have any business doing that, guys. There's no legal requirement. And Ripple's attorney Stuart Alderati stated that the SEC seems to only punish and intimidate Ripple with the, and the whole industry rather than applying the law. Our response will be filed next month. But as we have all seen time and time again, this is a regulator that trades in statements that are false, mischaracterized, and designed to mislead. They stayed true to form here. Ripple will submit its opposition in the court on April 22nd, and the SEC will file its reply on May 6th as per extended dates approved by George Torres. So now we're waiting on Ripple's reply, guys, and this should be a good one. And how wild is this Ripple case wrapping up? And at the same time, we're hearing rumors of the SEC might be going after the Ethereum Foundation for their ICO with Ether. There's a lot of skeletons in those closets. We have Stephen Narioff here posting, I think Gary Gensler cares about the 14 gigabytes on me. The SEC's false prosecution was to silence me from exposing the Ethereum free pass. They must give these documents. Surely they discuss XRP and Ripple. I'll help get those docs for you. They may end up paying you $2 billion to go away. So yeah, the SEC has 14 gigabytes of data on Steven Naroff. What? That's a lot of data, guys. And he was found not guilty, didn't do anything wrong. He even gave his Ethereum back when he realized how corrupt the Ethereum Foundation was. So he's working on getting that those 14 gigs. Uh, you've got Empower Oversight that are suing the SEC because they won't give out the freedom of information requests between the SEC for any documents between the SEC and JP Morgan about Ripple or XRP. So why are they holding on to that? There is so much secretive stuff going on, guys. And the truth always comes to light in the end. I just can't wait to see it. And here, attorney Jeremy Hogan comments on this. Here's his take on the summary of the SEC's remedies brief. How dare Ripple not grovel before us? Instead of addressing some very real legal issues, it came across as petty and vindictive, punctuated by ex post as evidence. It had an opportunity to take the lead on some legal issues, and it didn't. And Tony from Thinking Crypto Podcast, Tony Edwards says the SEC has become rotten at its core. We continue to see their unlawful attacks against the crypto industry. And he's posting his interview with Meta Law, man. Let's see what he says. We have got to have these people resign and get new leadership. And so far, I'm just not seeing that happen. The judge concluded that 
this was not a case of a few bad apples, but mm. rather there was a pervasive culture of organizational bad faith. And the problem is the commission itself, who's giving the orders and all of that to cut corners like this and, and do this sort of thing. I don't know, but it's really, really troubling because mm. these people are supposed to be working for us. They're supposed to serve the people and what they're doing is lying to destroy Americans. What I would really like to see is former senior SEC officials coming forward right now and saying what needs to happen are resignations mm -hmm. at the top. Senior officials who care about the integrity of the SEC should step forward and say this is really, really wrong. That's right, Meta Law, man. Lots of news coming out today from at Drops XRP. New MasterCard report, March 2024, mentions Ripple in connection with CBDCs. Ripple is in talks with over a dozen governments for CBDC development, many of them for cross-border payments. And beneath there's two examples of Ripple being mentioned, along with MoneyGram and Stellar and Circle. And Smoke says, ask yourself, why would Swift cite Ripple and XRP specifically in two different documents about improving cross-border payments if using Ripple's technology wasn't in their plans? Even a UC Berkeley video confirmed the doc was legit. You have to look closely to understand. And on this Swift document, you can see the customers on both sides, the service providers the banks on both sides the ach on both sides going all the way down to the correspondent banking which uses swift at the bottom but it looks like it's just showing all the ways you can transfer money at the top is bitcoin between person to person and then we've got money spend and then uh, western union using the two transfer agents service providers using transfer wise and then it's showing ripple in the middle between two banks. Very interesting. And the settlement using Corda, company A and company B on the left, and the need for settlement, transfer of funds on Corda, Swift GPI, or cryptocurrency. Looks like the Corda seller will use any one of those three. And they've got XRP as an example of the cryptocurrency. And here's a video. Okay, so look, Western Union isn't going to go out of business anytime soon. They're going to adopt different technologies. Okay, but this is where the big money is. It's not in remittances. It's in these business-to-business -business payments across border. And that's why we have these kinds of companies like Ripple and Stellar. This is all about right, business-to-business, back-end, big-volume transactions, which are currently you know, very expensive. So if we look at the payment system, they're not sitting at the, like, you know, you're sending money back to your uncle. Right? It is... Right at the bank level. So the banks are making transactions with other banks. Now, nothing's changed here. You're still doing something like correspondent banking, except now, because the data needs to move around more quickly than the money moves around, right, we can settle these things more quickly. So the difference between a Bitcoin and a Ripple, in a nutshell, again, not too much time to elaborate, is that what Bitcoin uses is an open, permissionless, digital, I mean, distributed ledger system Right, where anybody can jump in and, and do a transaction. Right, that's kind of the beauty of it. I can go buy Bitcoin, you can go buy Bitcoin. We don't need to ask anybody's permission, and there's no middleman that can you know, accept or deny, approve or reject. It's distributed the consensus around validating these transactions. What's different about systems like Ripple and most of the blockchain systems that will prevail is that they are permissioned, meaning that you have to be you know, a member, and membership has its privileges. And so you have these different nodes, and the nodes basically know one another. Okay? And then if I want to give money to my uncle back in, in, you know, uh, in, in France, let's say, then I have to go to one of these banks that are a member of the Ripple network, and then my uncle will go to one of these banks that's a member of the Ripple network, and then those banks will do their transacting through this distributed ledger. Good explanation from Berkeley Haas. And Smoke also posting here, Bank of International Settlements discussing how a third-party currency with sufficient liquidity is needed for cross-border payments. Listen closely. With all that in mind, um, how do we deal with this 
issue of exchange rates and interoperability. How do we get these digital currencies to really just talk to each other? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and I think when we talk about interoperability, we can, we can see it at least in three different levels. So the first level is how we manage domestic interoperability. So how we generate this digital currency solution and make this speak with the other things that are out there uh, in a little bit in, in the idea of generating a platform so that everyone can connect to that platform and take advantage of the huge uh, network externalities that we can get out of there. The second level is how do we manage cross-border transactions, even within the same currency, and that presents a, a certain level of challenges there. But when we talk about cross-currency and cross-border, then we face a, a completely difficult, difficult and different environment, and we can see three dimensions here. One is the technical dimension, so how we manage to get a system that speaks in a certain cryptographic language to speak with another that speaks another slightly different language. So that is one a level of complexity. We need to get the technologies to speak to each other. The messaging element is fundamental. The second dimension, which is much more complicated to solve, so that one, the first one was the easy one, okay? And uh, there is a lot of money that is being put in terms of, of trying to solve these technical issues of, of interoperability. Now, the second one is more complicated. It has to do with liquidity. So imagine that you have a pair of currencies for which there is not a, a complementary demand. You need to go and uh, search for a third-party uh, uh, currency in order to make this, uh, this settlement actually happen. And this really complicates things. Uh, so we need to put pieces of technology that can uh, make more efficiency this use of liquidity so that more transactions can be settled. The third dimension, which is even more difficult than the previous one, is how do we manage to get homogeneity in terms of the policy requirements on different countries. And this becomes even more complicated when we think about, for example, AML CFT and principles-based policies, and when we think about risk-based policies. We can code things that are very clearly stated, you know, but when we're talking about principles-based regulation, this thing becomes really complicated, especially in an environment, uh, as Tom said, in which uh, 110 nations might have 110 different ways of, of looking at this. So, so we need work in these three dimensions, technology, liquidity, and also, uh, and more importantly, probably in the policy side of things. Think about AML CFT, but also think about uh, privacy. Uh, different countries have very different views on this, no? They have to have interoperability and liquidity. And you can get mad at Ripple all you want for selling their XRP. But guys, if it's a currency, it has to be put out into the world. It has to be liquid to operate. We have to have these coins in as many hands as possible because we're going to be the liquidity, guys. When the big guys jump in, they're going to need to buy it from us. And here we have Nerdy X posting in July. Everything has to be wrapped up by November. Here's a chart he's got from Mojo Loop. Here's their roadmap. And he says, you are here at the Mojo Loop Zambezi. Mojo Loop releases. We got pillar one, pillar two, and pillar three connect to other systems. This is the pillar three we were waiting on. CNPs for Swift and Nexus and the native ISO 2022 goes live November 2024. But before that, in July of 24, we've got participation tools, payment manager on prem, firms POC for pilot or live Mojo Loop development. Looks like Mojo Loop has their plan. And their roadmap laid out. And from ISO 2022 HSBC to launch tokenized gold tomorrow. Guys, we know that the background of the new financial system is gold and hard assets. And they have to tokenize real world assets. That's the new theme. That's the new trend that's going on. Real world assets. London headquartered HSBC is actively exploring various opportunities to convert real world assets into digital form. One such area is tokenized gold, which it will introduce tomorrow to its retail segment. HSBC will be launching tokenized gold tomorrow to its retail clients, said Hong Kong Chief Digital Officer Prochan Berdovic during a panel at the Milken Institute Global Investors Symposium. This will mark the first form of tokenized real world asset that it is introducing to the segment. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get a price on gold before we get out of here, guys. 2,182. Ooh, it just jumped back to 2,177. So gold's looking a little volatile. Central banks have been buying gold 
for decades trying to keep it hidden what the plan is. They know the future's coming soon. They know the level playing field is almost here. We just have to get through it, guys. Hold on tight. Not financial advice. Stay high-spirited. Don't let the fusters get you down. We're ready for the moon. We're ready for the rocket ship. Let's go. Mr. Connector out.